In the the let's see in, in this one he's at home. If Frank were at home in these situations, remember they had total income of thirty six thousand dollars. They'd still have all the income. Frank would be at home. Mary's at home. They get social security. The real estate taxes, the utilities, the insurance, the food, all stay the same. We're assuming that if Frank is on the frail elder waiver, they're not they don't they got more med costs. They're just going to have more kind of general expenses taking care of Frank at home. So we're assuming that Mary's fund has gone down, and so is Frank's. But they're still breaking even. They're still breaking even. So in this situation, even if Frank is very sick, um, they can still continue to not be eating into their savings. They still have their home. Next slide. And um, in plan two, so now what happens if instead of Frank being at home, Frank needs to go to the nursing home and Mary wants to stay at home in the situation that we gave? Well, in that situation too, um, Frank can immediately qualify for Mass Health, and the reason for that is he can shift. Remember, he can shift all of his assets to Mary, and there's no five-year look-back period to that. He can have up to two thousand dollars in countable assets because he's in the nursing home. Mary can own the home, right? So that's not that the house isn't vulnerable. Remember, though, she's got some cash. She had three hundred thousand dollars in cash. And, and the Mass Health rule is that she can't have more than one hundred thirteen thousand something. I always get that wrong. It's like two forty or five sixty or something. One hundred thirteen thousand and some change she can have in cash or things convertible into cash, which means she'd have too much cash. But but the key to this situation is the spouse at home, when one person's in the nursing home, can have infinite income, infinite income. So what Mary could do in this case is go buy herself an annuity. She would take 200000 out of the 300000 and buy herself a 10-year annuity. As it happens, um, um, in, in Mary's case, 10 years is about equal to her actuarial life expectancy. Um, so she could buy this annuity. If she buys the annuity, it would pay her about, for $200,000 today, it would pay her about $1,700 per month for 10 years. Mary would then change her will. Remember, we've talked about that. She would change her will again so as to make sure that if she died, the house and all the rest of the cash went into trust. She would also say in the annuity that if she died, any of the remaining payments would go into trust. So once again, Frank's in the nursing home. Mary's at home. Frank has qualified for mass health. They haven't had to spend any money on the nursing home. Next slide. In that situation, how's Mary doing? We know how Frank's doing. Unfortunately, he's stuck in the nursing home. But... Mass Health is paying most of the bills. Um, if Frank qualified for, for Mass Health in that case, his income monthly would have to go to the nursing home. So that $2,000 a month or $24,000 a year that he was contributing to the household would now be getting paid to the nursing home and Mass Health would be paying the rest. However, remember, Mary bought the annuity. And so Mary is now getting. Um, 12,000, as Mary is now getting $1,700 a month or about $20,000 a year from that annuity. So Mary's income, just by herself, is $32,000. Now, assuming she's got the same real estate taxes, the same utilities, the same insurance, her food's gone down because Frank's in the nursing home, but assuming it's still big, she's actually still got some room for fun. She can still, she's still finding that she's got $14,000 a month extra um, in addition to going to visit Frank and doing all of the other stuff. So in terms of their goal, in terms of the couple's goal, going back, live at home, die in the backyard, leave the house to the kids, the house is still safe, Mary is still at home, and Mary is still breaking even. She has, she has needed to buy the annuity, so she's had to use some of her savings, right? But with those savings, for 10 years, she's safe. Okay? Now, by the way, I'm going to be happy to take any questions in any of this at the end. I know this is a lot of material, but I really just wanted to give you a sense of how some of this planning can kind of play out over, all, over the rest of your life. Next slide. So now, <clears throat> we're going to assume that it was plan two. 
that Frank was stuck in the nursing home and Mary had bought the annuity. And then at some point during that 10 years, Frank died um, and the annuity ran out. And the annu because now it's, it's, it's 10 years later. So instead of being 79, Mary is now 89. So now what? Next slide. So now Mary from a Frank died. So Mary now gets Frank's social security check, right, which was 2000 a month. So she's living on $24,000 a month now. She's got 100000 in assets left. Because remember, she had 300000 but she had used 200 to buy the annuity. So she didn't have to spend anything during these years. So we're assuming that you know, she didn't get, didn't get any bigger or small. Right? Now, her expenses, we're assuming 10 years later that even though the selectmen here are doing a great job for you, that the taxes did go up a little bit during those 10 years and that the taxes are now $4,500. we are assuming utilities went up to $4,500. The insurance stayed flat at $3,000. She's got $12,000 a year that she's spending on food because we figured that one up a little bit. But boy, she's having no fun. At the end of that 10 years, she's living close. She's really living close. So what can she do now? She's still breaking even. She's not having a great time. But she's kind of like living on the edge. If anything goes wrong, she's got a problem. Next slide. Well, that may be the time at which she wants to consider buying a reverse mortgage. Now. Are reverse mortgages a good idea or a bad idea? I don't know. It's all about doing the math. I know I've talked to people who just will never consider doing a reverse mortgage, and that's fine. And I always tell people, unless you need it, you don't want to do a reverse mortgage. Because a reverse, doing a reverse mortgage, <clears throat> I always describe it for folks, it's something like it's kind of selling your house early and keeping a life estate. Because if you've got a reverse mortgage, the, the way reverse mortgages work, reverse mortgage is one-on-one. Um, there, there are two kinds, the federally insured kind and the non-federally insured kind. Don't even think about the non-federally insured kind because there are so few of them. There's a little tiny state program that does non-federally insured reverse mortgages, but at the end of the reverse mortgage period, you have to pay the reverse mortgage. Not good. <laughs> That's the, kind of the point of the reverse mortgage is that you know that you know, you're never going to get thrown out. So the ones that the big program is all federally insured. They're called HECM mortgages, home equity something mortgages. Um, so I can't remember the C. So home equity something mortgages. Um, the amount that you get is actually based on the value of the property and based on your age. The older you are, the higher the percentage of the total value that you, get, you can get from the property. Um, you have to repay the mortgage, but only after your debt. Only after your debt, which means you're not really repaying the mortgage, or after you've been out of the house for a year. But remember, um, Frank and Mary's goal, or Mary's goal, they're gonna, she's going to stay in the house. So unless they're dragging her out, unless she's stuck in a nursing home because she just can't do it anymore at home, she's staying at home. So for her, at 89, given her other alternatives, this might not be a bad idea. Next slide. <clears throat> well. If she is 89, and we're assuming that after those 10 years, the taxes went up also because the house value went up to $500,000. Remember, we assumed that it was $400,000 to start. So we're assuming at the end of those 10 years that the house value is $500,000. If she's 89 and the house value is $500,000 right now, she can get a reverse mortgage for $375,000. It's very big. Once again, the percentage keeps get, of the value keeps getting bigger the older you get, because it only has to last until you die. So, you know, at 89, you know, the life expectancy is about five years. I think it's 4.5 or five years. So they'll give you a lot of money. So we're assuming that she's getting the reverse mortgage, and she's then got, turning around, and she's buying another annuity. We're assuming that she's 89. She doesn't want to go in the investment business. You know, she doesn't want to buy stock. You know, she wants a predictable income stream. Uh, and we're doing it for five years because that's shorter than her actuarial life expectancy. And I'm going to talk about that a little, in a little while. If she did that, that's what she would be getting per month out of that annuity, $6,250. Which means her, her amount of money available for fun and savings uh, is about $75,000 a year. So she can have a really good time. Or she can have a little bit of a good time and she can save the rest of the money. Next slide. Um, a second possibility. Now, suppose that she, that she had done all that and then during that five-year period, instead of just kind of living along and just accumulating these money, this money, she, she, still, she needs nursing home care. Well, in that case, 
um, what would happen would be her regular income, that $2,000 a month that she gets, would go to the nursing home. She could qualify for, the nurse, for, uh, for a nursing home care right away. Um, she's, remember in our situation, she had, there is an extra um, $100,000 that she had in savings. All of that money, though, could be put into something called a D4C pooled trust. What are they? Uh, once again, I've talked about some of these things in previous seminars. They are the place where you can park as much money as you want uh, if you are a person who is in a nursing home and wants to qualify for mass health. You park the money there, and then the folks who run the pool trust, there are four of them in Massachusetts, um, can use that money to provide for any of your supplementary needs as long as you're alive. Now, following your death, um, if, if, you've been, if you've been on mass health, and the reason why you usually put money in the D4C is you can qualify for mass health because you cut down your assets to below $2,000 by putting the money in the D4C. If you're on mass health, then following your death, mass health is going to be able to recapture from that remaining pool of D4C money whatever they paid on your behalf. So this isn't something that you're going to do. Well, this is, this is something that your kids are really going to groan about sometimes <laughs> because they're like, oh my God, you know, this, this money, the money is still going to all go to mass health. And that's true, except that that's not my client here. My client is Mary. And Mary wants to live as well as she can live until she dies. And it's Mary's money, right? It's Mary's house. This, this is all Mary's money. So this is a strategy to make sure that Mary is okay. So if she ends up going to the nursing home, then that 100000 could go into the D4C. And if the house then gets sold, because the house is supposed to get sold um, within a year after she qualifies for MassHealth, any of the remaining proceeds from the house would go into the D4C. Next slide.